This is a takeoff that almost went very, very wrong. First, I'm gonna show you exactly what happened, and then I'm going to show the analysis I did to find out exactly what went wrong, why, and how I'm going to prevent this from ever happening in the future. Columbia traffic, November 797, Delta Lima departing 36. Airspeed's alive. 50, 60, nose pressure back, and airborne it. Too, too slow. Oh, shit. come on, up you get. We can jump in citation 87, number zero, or uh, 40 miles. Up you get, up you get. Uh, wow, that was scary. What the hell was that? That was uh, early rotation. Yes, it was early rotation. And not only that, it was early uncommanded rotation. So why did my airplane rotate itself off the ground when I was not ready for it at a speed that was perilously close to stall speed? Well, let's have a look first at a normal takeoff. This is a takeoff exactly a week earlier where I do pretty much the exact same thing Yet, I rotate normally and climb out normally. All right, full power applied, checking instruments, release the brakes. I'm seeing the airspeed come alive. And here's the bumpy runway that's bumping my the nose of my airplane up and down a bit. Watching the speeds. And about 60 knots, a little bit of back pressure. Wait till 70, 75 and rotate. Okay, so I'll climb a little bit. Now I'm going to nose over just a little bit, speed up to VX, and then nose back to climb up over the trees. All right, perfectly normal takeoff. One of the first things I wondered was, did I have a headwind taking off? I have a Garmin G3X that logs a ton of data every second while the airplane is flying, so I pulled all the data logs out of it and generated a ton of graphs to analyze just what went on. You can see at the top, I did ground speed versus indicated airspeed. The black line is the indicated airspeed, whereas the blue line is the ground speed. So you want the indicated airspeed to be higher than the ground speed, which indicates that you have a headwind, not a tailwind. If the blue line was on top of the black line, that would indicate that I actually took off with a tailwind. But in both cases, I took off with a headwind. I did have a look at the engine. I thought, well, maybe the engine wasn't developing as much power. However, you can see the engine RPM was pretty much identical both times. And if you look at the altitude, you can see the altitude was obviously, I dipped down at the beginning. It, the altitude does kind of dip uh, when the airplane just rotates off the ground due to a difference in the, the pressure being detected at the static port as the airplane actually lifts off. However, you can see the climb rate in the second on the right, uh, which is that blue line, is definitely slower on the incident takeoff. Density altitude. It was definitely a hot day the second time. The first time it was quite cool, it was below ISA. The field elevation there is just over 800 feet. The density altitude on the normal takeoff was 459 feet. However, the density altitude on the incident takeoff was 1,623 feet. So significantly higher, but definitely not enough that it would explain what was going on here. If you look at the normal takeoff, the time from when I started rolling until I rotated it was 22 seconds, and when the airplane came off the ground, it was traveling at 80 knots indicated. On the incident takeoff, the time from when I started to roll to when the aircraft rotated was only 17 seconds, and when I rotated, the aircraft was traveling at 63 knots indicated, and that is pretty much the stall speed of this airplane. Of course, it didn't stall because I was in ground effect, luckily. Let's have a look at a comparison of the two different takeoffs with the normal takeoff on the left and the incident takeoff on the right. The sound, if you're listening in stereo speakers, on the left you'll hear the left audio and on the right you'll hear the audio from the incident takeoff. Roll 
airspeed's alive. 50, 60, nose pressure back, and airborne it. Too, too slow. Oh, come on, up you get. Up you get, up you get. Wow, that was scary. What the hell was that? All right, when this happened, I only had fractions of a second to react and decide what I was going to do. So let's have a look at this footage again, and I'll talk through exactly what happened, what I did in order to not crash into those trees at the end of the runway. First thing I do, check the engine instruments, make sure everything's in the green. Once that's all okay, release the brakes, and we start rolling. So I check to make sure the airspeed is now indicated, which it is. Airspeed's alive. And at this point, I accelerate down the runway until I reach 60 knots. When I get to 60 knots, I put a very gentle back pressure on the stick. This takes some of the weight off the nose and gets the canard ready to fly. On a typical day, when I reach 65 knots on this runway, that's my abort limit point. If I have gotten to 65 knots, I'm committed to going flying because I no longer have enough runway to stop before I hit trees at the end. I will I will run off the runway if I try to stop at that point. So up until I hit 65, if something goes wrong, I will hit the brakes and stop on the runway. Beyond 65 knots, I'm going flying. 50, 60, nose pressure back. So now at this point, I've accelerated, I've hit 60 knots, I've got nose back pressure, and all of a sudden, the airplane pops up into the air. And airborne it. It's flying. This is extremely bad because when the airplane is on the ground, it's not making lift. And when you make lift, you also make drag. So because it's not making lift, the airplane has a lot less drag while it's running on the ground on the runway. So it's accelerating faster. However, the airplane is now suddenly popped into the air. It's flying. So it's creating a lot of drag because it's generating lift, which means it is not accelerating as fast anymore. So I've got two problems now. I have an airplane that is flying and I cannot land it at this point. I, if I were to try to force it back down on the runway and stop, I will run off the runway into the trees. So I am committed. I have to fly at this point. However, it's, it's accelerating slow and I'm just barely above stall. So the first thing I do is nose down. If I pull the nose up, I'll increase drag, it won't climb, and I'll end, end up in the trees. As unintuitive as it seems, the first thing I do is I push the nose over, keep the airplane in ground effect. I do this for just a couple of seconds. Too slow. Oh. I do this just for a couple of seconds. I watch the airspeed get up to 71 knots, and I decide, okay, I'm gonna start pulling it back at this point. As soon as I do that, I see the speed start to decay, but I am not climbing. I realize I do not have enough airspeed yet, so I push the nose over again. I'm out of ground effect, but I still need to get the plane level because I need to accelerate. I need more airspeed. So again, unintuitive as it is, I see trees coming up towards me and I'm below those trees. But again, I push the nose over because I need airspeed. Come on, up you get. So I hold it like this, pointed at the trees for five more seconds until I get to 85 knots. At this point, I'm really flying the airplane by feel and by judging the trees and knowing what the climb performance is. It's really just experience at this point. So I got to this point, I'm, I'm, I know that the airplane will climb. Looking at the trees, I'm reasonably sure that I'm gonna be able to out climb the trees, but not if I wait much longer. So I, I start pulling back on the nose again to get up over those trees and it does. Up you get, up you get. Wow, that was scary. What the hell was that? That was uh, early rotation. So thankfully it worked out. Why did this happen? Why did my airplane pop itself into the air? Why did it rotate when I did not command it to rotate? I had to concentrate on what was different. Clearly this is not happening all the time. I've taken off this runway many times and it only happened this one time. So what was different? Well, there was two things that were different and 
from the analysis that I did, it's both of these combined that caused this. The first is density altitude. The density altitude caused the takeoff run to be a little bit longer than it usually is. I was not accelerating quite as fast because the engine wasn't developing quite as much power because the air was thinner, it was hotter outside. So because I had a higher density altitude, the engine was making a little bit less power, it was not accelerating quite as fast. The second is ballast. When I'm flying by myself, I normally carry a 25 ballast weight in the nose, as well as a 25 pound ballast pretty much in the passenger seat, on the co-pilot seat. That's to ensure that the airplane is in proper CG when I'm flying it by myself. However, this flight was different because I have a new hard point that I mounted up on the nose to fasten the ballast to. So originally, I only had space for one ballast because I didn't have a dedicated hard point to secure it to. Now that I do, I moved both ballast weights up right into the front of the nose. This brings my CG forward a little bit and much closer to the center of the envelope. However, this means there's a lot more weight right at the very end of the airplane, right at the nose, and that, that is a large moment arm with a lot of inertia. There's a springy, flexible nose gear underneath there that every time I hit a bump, it absorbs energy and then it releases that energy. Now, because I have way more weight, we have almost double the weight up there, when that nose gear compresses, it then absorbs much more energy and then pushes up with that energy. So if you notice, have a look when I'm going over these bumps right at the very beginning, I'm getting a lot of energy. The nose is, is bumping up and down and up and down much more than it usually does. That's because I have all that extra weight in the nose this time. It's like a pendulum up there being pushed up and down. The second problem is that there's a large dip in the runway. Normally, I will have rotated before that, or I at least have the pressure off the nose wheels. It's not really affected by that dip. However, this time, I was running with higher density altitude, my takeoff roll was longer, and so when I hit that dip, I had just put a little bit of back pressure on the elevator. So now the nose wheel went down into that dip pretty much at the exact same time as I applied back pressure to unload the nose wheel, and so then it, it pogoed up into the air, being pushed back up by that dip. That, along with the fact that I now had back pressure and had unloaded the, the canard, meant that all that energy shoved my canard way up in the air. And because I was at a flying speed, I was pretty much right at stall speed, it caused the canard to rise high enough that the main wing rotated and started generating lift, the airplane lifted into the air. So how do I make sure this never happens again? I have a three-fold plan. First off, uh, the ballast weight, the 25 pound ballast that I moved from the passenger seat area, it's not on the passenger seat, it's actually underneath it, but the passenger seat area up to the nose, that is gonna move back to where it was originally, where I have not had problems with it before. Obviously having 50 pounds up front is just too much. Uh, it causes too much springiness and, and there's too much momentum up there. That's an easy change, it'll happen right away. Second, operational change, when I'm taking off on that runway, which is 3.6 at Columbia, uh, I will not be unloading the nose at 60 knots. Uh, I will basically hold the nose on the ground, especially when I know what I'm going through those, that area of dips there, so that it does not pogo my nose up into the air like it did there. And I'll simply hold it until I actually have rotation speed, proper rotation speed, and then I'll rotate it off the runway. That's, again, an easy change. Third one, not so easy. I'm campaigning with the owner of the airport to get the runway fixed. I've already talked to him. Uh, I talked to him just a couple days after this actually occurred, and I'm going to be continuing to work with him to try to understand that this is a definite safety issue on this runway. And better than that, the FAA lists the runway as in poor condition, which clearly it is, and I think he would get a lot more business and a lot more transient aircraft, a lot more people coming in buying fuel if the runway was in good enough condition and FAA didn't list it in the AFD as in poor condition. If it had good condition in there, we'd have a lot more airplanes coming in, a lot more business, a lot more revenue. I'm trying to appeal to his pocketbook. We'll see how that goes. 
I know after this actually happened, I really wanted to get down to the bottom. I pulled a ton of data out of the G3X, uh, synced it up with the video, because I wanted to make sure what I was seeing was wh exactly what happened, and it really helped to understand exactly what caused that. I was fairly sure, I mean, as soon as I was climbing out afterwards, I was pretty sure I knew had exactly what had happened and why, but I wanted to know. I wanted actual hard data that supported that hypothesis. And it turns out that, yes, the hypothesis was correct. So I hope you found this video of some interest. If you did, hey, click like. It really helps me out when you do that. If you have any comments, suggestions, corrections, especially, I, I, I absolutely admit I am no expert on this. I have a lot of background in aviation, but uh, I am definitely learning. So if you see something that I missed, please speak up and let me know in the comments section below. And if you have 10 seconds, just hey, click like, subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out when you do that and it helps me grow the channel so that I can create even more videos for everyone to watch. All right, that's it. Thanks for watching.